Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are very present. We sense you. We love you. We offer our feeble efforts to the glory of your name. Ensure now that the words that I say are acceptable in your sight. You are our Lord and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, maybe part of the problem with getting our heads around this is the use of the word proclamation because it's a tricky one, isn't it? And as Hugh was pointing out, it can kind of imply, you know, preaching, standing out in front or behind lecterns, as Billy Graham style, that's proclamation. And uh, I understand that that's problematic and I understand that that can actually be intimidating for people. It's like, well, I'm not very good with words, I'm not very good with presenting ideas verbally and the like. And I want to reiterate what Hugh was saying and that is to, like, free evangelism from only ever being about some kind of bold or public proclamation. Not to rule that out but to suggest that that's one of the ways in which the gospel is proclaimed. Uh, trust me on this, I actually have studied this stuff. When you read the epistles of Paul, there's nowhere that Paul says, and you, some people are not going to be happy to hear this and will like go th thumbing through their Bible, but there is nowhere that it actually says every believer should proclaim the gospel publicly. And I, I used to think it's what it said too, but when you look into it, he doesn't actually say that. As far as evangelism is concerned, it seems as the best I can reconstruct it, Paul actually anticipates that evangelism in and through local churches will happen at kind of two levels and involve two different groups of Christians. On the one hand, there are those gifted evangelists and apostles who are actually called to bold proclamation. And it's clear when you read his letters that he puts himself in that category. It's clear when you read his letters that he assumes that those apostolic and evangelistic proclaimers could be translocal, like himself, moving around to different churches, proclaiming the gospel, calling people to faith, planting churches, or they could be local we know that he tells, say, Timothy, who's a local pastor, to do the work of the evangelist. So there's a particular category of Christians, those with the particular gift through the Holy Spirit of evangelism, uh, apostolic leaders who are called either locally or translocally to publicly proclaim the gospel. But Paul does not put every Christian in that category. He assumes that other Christians will still need to talk about Jesus, but not in the same manner that these ones do. And let me tell you uh, why I think that's the case. Let me give you a, um, uh, an example from Scripture. Just, I mean, there's plenty of them, but just one to get us thinking about this. At the end of his letter to the Colossians, in chapter 4, Paul He's kind of wrapping up, he's closing up the letter, and he's asking them to pray. He's like, in closing, like, could you remember us in prayer? Pray for these kinds of things. And in verse 2, he, he asks them to pray for himself. Actually, he asks them to pray for the people in this category I just mentioned, the evangelists and the apostles. Colossians 4, verse 2, he says this, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us, the apostolic band. Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So what he's saying is that there are some of us who are called to this bold proclamation kind of thing. And I want you to pray for us, would you, for in that category. For the evangelists and the apostolic kind of leaders, local or translocal, could you pray some very specific things according to this passage? Could you pray that opportunities would abound? Could you pray that we'd get opportunities to speak at the Areopagus or at some famous person's house or in a marketplace? Or you'd Pray that these doors would open so that we can exercise this gift of proclamation. And then the second thing he asked them to pray for him is that we would do it with clarity. So we wouldn't foul it up. We wouldn't kind of cut some corners or leave some bits out. 
So boldness, opportunities, and clarity. That's what you should be praying for these gifted evangelists and for the apostolic band. Now, if he expected that all of us should do what the gifted evangelists and the apostles do, then wouldn't it follow that the next verse would say, oh, and while you're praying that stuff, you should pray it for yourself too. You should pray that you too get opportunities and that you boldly proclaim the gospel and you do it with real clarity. But he doesn't. And it would seem perfectly natural for him to lead into that if that's what he really believed. But I don't think he does believe that. I think, as I said, there's this category of particular Christians who have the the ministry of bold proclamation, bold, clear proclamation. And then there's the rest of us in the church who are still meant to talk about Jesus, but he doesn't ask you to pray for boldness or for clarity or for opportunities Listen to what he asks you to pray effectively for yourselves. Verse 5. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with delicious salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, hear the really subtle distinction in this. There are some of you who are gifted as evangelists and as apostles. And your job is like to put your foot in the door, to make opportunities happen, to boldly proclaim, to be full of clarity and energy and vitality. Go for it. But then for the rest of us who think that that sounds terrifying... You're not actually called to have to worry about doing that kind of stuff anyway. What does he say to you? He says, to you, here's what I want you to be be praying for. That you would be really, really good at socialising. That you'd be a fantastic conversationalist. That people would find you really interesting and tasty and delicious to talk to. And that when they ask you questions about who you are or what you're doing, you'd always be ready to talk about Jesus as the answer to those questions. Now listen to the difference in that. Some of you in this room are gifted evangelists, so we should be praying you get opportunities to like preach your head off. But most of you in this room are probably in that second category. And you know what we should be praying for you? We should be praying that you get asked lots of questions. The catalyst for the gifted evangelist would be them making opportunities happen. But the catalyst for the, if I can say, average Christian, the catalyst for us talking about Jesus would be when people ask us who we are, why we live the way we live, or what we do. So therefore, does it not follow that if the catalyst for us speaking about Jesus is answering people's questions, that the only way that this is ever going to happen is if we actually live questionable lives. I mean, if your life is just like every other you know, suburban American life, like, what's questionable about that? <laughs> it was like you're just doing all the same subjects I did at university. You're just, like, dreaming of earning the same kind of money I'm earning. You're just dreaming of having a house like I have. If you just want to, like, get married, have a house, follow the American dream, do the routine, just, just like I want to do. If you want to spend your money on the same kind of vacations as I have and buy the same kind of shit that I have, like, how is that questionable? Like, how is that interesting? Like... What's intriguing about this? What's like disturbing or what's weird about this? What the early church did was this. They effectively trained their evangelists and their apostles to proclaim the gospel with clarity and they trained everybody else to be as socially weird and as interesting as possible. Just about every story that Hugh told you about him talking to someone about the gospel was when they were asking him, like, what the heck are you doing converting this derelict building into something? Why on earth are you living this way? Why do you do this? What were they, what were they doing? They were asking him about his questionable life. You know what the American suburban church has done? It's trained you to fit in. It taught you to look like everybody else. It said, do you love Jesus, but don't be weird about it. That's the opposite of what the early church was doing. It was like, love Jesus and be as weird as you can be about it. <laughs> not, like, not like sort of crazy, zany, Christian weird. 
just so different that I've never met anybody like you. When I first met Hugh, like I thought he seemed like a nice enough guy. But like Brian said tonight, the time I make my eyes widened and I thought, whoa, wait a second. It was the first time I went to his home in Denver. And I watched him with his wife and with his family and with his neighbours. And then it's like, okay, this isn't normal. <laughs> this is intriguing. How much help does your church give you in equipping you and training you to be questionable? You've got a head full of gospel knowledge and nobody's asking you anything. And if nobody's asking you anything, no wonder you're tongue-tied and frustrated. You were taught how to fit in, look like everyone else, and then at work on Monday at the water cooler, everyone's like, what did you do on the weekend? I got wasted, I got smashed, I got fried, I had an amazing time, met this person, I did this. What did you do? Oh, I went to church. Expecting them to say, holy mackerel, you did what? <laughs> stop, stop, shush, shush. What did you do yesterday? Church? What is that? Tell me more. Why do you do that? Church going is not questionable. Like being a like fine, upstanding citizen, it's not questionable. But throwing your lot in to serve the poor, that's odd. Committing yourself to racial reconciliation, that's kind of weird. Deciding that you're going to pay a, take a, a lesser paying job in order to be freer to serve others, that's so odd. Like giving up yourself in the service of others, like what, huh? My friends, this is what the early church did. They turned the empire upside down by living differently to everybody else. And when everybody else said, like, what on earth are you? Then they spoke the name of Jesus. They literally turned the empire upside down. They built hospices, feeding programs. Whenever a village or a town, it was heard that a, the plague had landed there, Christians would go there. When everyone else was leaving, Christians would go there knowing that they would probably die to minister and to preach the gospel to people in their last days. These people were known as the ones who would feed anyone at their love feasts, who treated their, their, their uh, wives like sisters, like equals. Every man in the empire at that time had three women, a wife to take care of his home and children, a mistress to be seen public with, and a concubine to have sex with. Like, that's not weird, that's not normal, that's not sinful, that's not terrible, that's just, like, normal. And then these Christians come along and they have one spouse and they treat her like their sister, like their friend. It was like, what? This was a, con a context where Jews and Gentiles, where Africans, where Asians, where Europeans worshipped as one, where slave and free were brother and sister, it was unheard of. And everyone wanted to know, who the heck are you people? By the fourth century, the Christian church had so subverted the empire, so many people had come to know Christ, that the emperor Julian, anxious that the whole empire might become Christian and abandon the worship of the, the Roman gods and him as a Roman god, became anxious and thought that we must do something to kind of stop or halt this Christian growth. There's a very famous letter that he writes to the governors uh, throughout the empire where he says, I figured out what these Galileans do. They trick people. They feed them. They give them something to drink. They welcome everyone at their love feasts. They pretend to treat their spouses like sisters. They welcome the slave and the free. There's generosity, hospitality, justice, kindness, mercy, reconciliation. But it's all just a trick. And he actually, in his letter, he says it's like putting out cake on the road to entice children to follow them and then to sell them into slavery. So we need to stop them from subverting the empire with their evil tricks of doing kindness and good to everyone. 
So here's what I want you to do. I am sending you a truckload of Roman coin, all you governors throughout the empire. And what I want you to do is to outlove the Christians. They actually tend to the graves of people they don't know. They take dying people into their homes who aren't their relatives. They feed those who are hungry irrespective of what village they come from. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to start instituting some civil works to take care of graveyards, build hospices, feeding programs. Basically, he's instituting Rome's first ever social security system to outlove the Christians. Now, can you guess what happens when a Roman emperor sends lots and lots of money to various governors all throughout the pagan empire? There are all sorts of like extensions on people's homes and pools were put in and <laughs> it's like all that money disappeared and there was nothing to show for it. Because what Julian did not understand was that for the Christians this wasn't a strategy. This wasn't like some trick or technique. But to feed the hungry, to take the homeless into your home, to fashion an alternative society of justice and equity and mercy and kindness, this was just the overflow of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their lives. This was something that they could not not be. And then when these people brought light and beauty into your village or your community, of course you would say, And they'd say, it doesn't matter who I am, but can I tell you who sent me? My friends, if no one's asking you any questions, it's probably because your life looks just like theirs. And if your life looks just like theirs, you're going to remain continually frustrated by the lack of proclamation going on in your lives. Put yourself in a context where people want to know why you would do the things you do. Years ago when Alan Hirsch and I were researching a book we were writing on missional communities, you guys hadn't started, otherwise we'd just write all about the underground. But we were in San Francisco and um, uh, Mark Scandrett and a few others, uh, Linda Burquist, people like that who were there, they said to us, oh, we know some communities you should check out. So we went and met a few different communities and everyone was saying to us, oh, you should go down to the subterranean shoe room and meet Brock Bingerman. And we were like, sorry, what is it, the subterranean shoe room? They're like, yeah, it's a shoe store down in the, in the Mission District. I was like, no, 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 we're looking for kind of uh, missional communities more than, say, businesses and the like. No, they said, no, you should probably go meet him. I think he might be interested. Well, we were driving down Mission, and we saw it, subterranean shoe room. So I was like, well, well, we might as well just stop and find out what he's doing. So we pulled over, we walked in. It's a shoe store. It's like there's shelves on all the walls with shoes all over them. There's a big chase lounge right in the middle of the room. Uh, there's Brock, and he's attending to a, a customer. So we walk in, not that into shoes, but like just acting like we were. And then he comes over, and, hi, can I help you? And we're like, oh, actually, we should say we're not here for shoes. Um, we're researching this book. We've been meeting all these kind of missional communities, and a lot of people tell us we should talk to you. Like, what, why? do you know why they would say that? And he's like, oh. Not really. I mean, what I do is not that big of a deal, he said. I, I came to San Francisco to be a church planter. I'm a Southern Baptist church planter, he said. So I came here, I was going to rent a hall, put out the chairs, get a band, send out flyers, advertise like crazy, try and attract as many people to my launch as I possibly could. He said, when I got here, I discovered San Francisco's crawling with failed church planters. That if you rent a hall and put out the chairs and get a band and advertise, like, no one comes. He said, I realized, oh, no, why should I try something that better people than me have failed at? So he said, um, I needed to work, I needed, you know, jobs. So he said, I just fell back on my, on my first love. And we said, what, well, what, what is your first love? Shoes, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I've been collecting shoes since I was like 12 years old. He said, I love, I love shoes. Like, this guy's the Imelda Marcos of the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> For those of you who know what that means. 
No, I love shoes. I just, I really know shoes. Uh, maybe why people suggest you should come and talk to me is I do have a little technique that I that I use. When customers come into the store, um, they're looking around. I go over to them and I say, you know what all shoe store guys say, uh, may I help you? And then they say what everyone in a shoe store always says, yeah, I'm not sure what I'm after, but I'm, I'm just looking. And then I say, he said, well, if you've got some time uh, and you'd like to sit on the Chase Lounge and tell me your life story, I'll tell you what kind of shoes you're looking for. <laughs> and he says... <laughs> he says that they're standing there, like, looking at the shoes and they, I, hear, they, I hear me give this pitch to them and then they're like... All right. He said, we sit on the Chase Lounge, he said, um, and they just tell me their life story. He said, I'm not a therapist, I'm a counsellor, I've had none of that training. I'm a Southern Baptist church planter. I haven't got a caring bone in my body. He said, I just like... <laughs> I just sit on the, on the Chase Lounge and then they just tell me their life. They grew up here, they went to school there, they're gay, they're straight, they're divorced, they're this, they're that. They're, you know, they just tell me, oh, I did this job, I went here, I moved here, I went there, I'm doing this. Blah, 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 blah. He said, some people can tell me their life story in like five minutes. Some people tell me their life story takes ages. But he said, I just sit and I listen, I just say, uh-huh, right, really? Oh, oh, really? Oh, yeah, wow, wow. I just listen to their whole life story. And the thing is, he said, I've been collecting shoes since I was 12, so I do know shoes. So if I do hear your life story, I'm pretty sure I know what kind of shoes a person like you is going to want. So after they've just told me their whole life story, sometimes telling me stuff that they later say they've never told anyone else before, I say to them, okay, wait here. And I go and select some shoes. And I bring them over to them and I say... Is this what you're looking for? And after they've just unburdened themselves of their whole life story, they usually look at the shoes and say, that's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> so he said, oh, I sell a lot of shoes. But then when I'm wrapping the shoes up and we're doing the transaction, they say to me, who, who are you? <laughs> he says, oh, I'm Brock, I'm the shoe store guy. No, 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 no. Like, what, like well, what are you? Like, are you, are you a psychotherapist, like, acting as a shoe store guy? Or, no, no, it's just a shoe store guy. No, no, no. You're like some kind of guru? Or you're like, are you, like, well, who are you? What are you? Is this some kind of holy man? Or like, no, 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 no. He says, I'm just a, just a shoe store guy. And says, you'd be amazed by how many people then say, you've got to meet my brother. Oh, I've got to introduce you to my wife. It's like, come to my party, come to my house, come to my home. He said, when I was a church planter, he said 99% of the people I knew were Christians. When I just became a questionable shoe store guy, 99% of the people I encounter are nowhere near the church. I have been to bat mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, divorce parties, weddings, you name it. Because I'm the listening guy. Because I guess in a city like San Francisco, listening is weird. Where did God send you? What did God call you to be? If no one's asking you, who you are or why you do what you do. No wonder you don't ever get to speak about Jesus. Poor you. I'm not going to condemn you if you don't talk about Jesus that much. Like, tisk tisk, get out there and tell more about Jesus. Because God designed you to answer questions. But the church taught you to be unquestionable. Poor you. What would it look like if you took some steps to step into spaces to live a life unlike everyone around you. Brian mentioned that I'd been recently arrested again. <laughs> I mentioned um, a story related to this in my workshop, but my country has a, an absolutely draconian and cruel beyond measure approach to refugees. If you manage to 
land on our shores and claim asylum, we actually put you in a concentration camp on an island in the middle of the Pacific and won't let you ever leave unless you go back where you came from. And you can't go back there because you escaped a civil war or you're a Rohingya Muslim from Burma or you escaped from Afghanistan because you're, you're a Hazari. It's, it's just, I mean, you think you've got problems building a wall. It's nothing compared with how despicable my country is. And as I said in my workshop, we've, like, we've held rallies and marches and campaigns and you name it. But recently, another news story came forth about something that was happening to some young Muslim men in Manus Island, one of these concentration camps or detention centres. And I had this visceral gut reaction to it. It was so despicable. And so a group of us uh, went to uh, the Prime Minister's residence. The Prime Minister's residence is right on the edge of Sydney Harbour. It's very gorgeous. looks like literally over the Opera House and all that kind of stuff. And it's got a big gate, as you can imagine. So a number of us, most of us ministers, but all of us Christians, uh, one of whom was a Iraqi refugee who has found faith at Hillsong Church. She, she was one of our number. Um, we pulled up before the security guards or the police could arrive and we ran over to the gate and we chained our necks to the, the gate and said, we're not leaving here until our Prime Minister responds to all of our requests a million times over for him to respond to this despicable situation. Now, who knew that if you did that, cops came out from everywhere... <laughs> News crews started appearing, setting up lights. All the neighbours started coming out. And here I am, like, chained around my neck to this <laughs> gate. It was really hot and sunny. We're standing there. And we're proclaiming. I'm proclaiming like crazy. Like, I'm doing this. I'm yelling to them. We're doing this in Jesus' name. Because King Jesus didn't design a future where people would be locked up hopelessly, helplessly, forever and ever and ever. Amen. He came to bring release to the captives, to bring freedom and hope to the poor. So we're standing here because we all love Jesus and we want this world to start to fall into a line with the values of the world that he came to bring into bear in this place. The cameras filmed all of this. We all got interviewed. And then the most beautiful thing started to happen. People were seeing this on the news. People were watching it on social media. Neighbours were coming out of these houses. This trans woman came over and she said, she said, I, w I saw this on the news, she said, and I, I think I know what it's like to be despised and marginalised and she said oh, I didn't know what else to do so I bought you some cake <laughs> I didn't want any cake <laughs> but I said to her I would be honoured to eat your cake older gentleman came and said, are you standing up, chained up to this gate? He said, I have a store around the corner. Do you want to sit on these plastic crates? So they put crates down for us to sit on. Then this woman from around the corner, I live around the corner, she said, um, uh, they don't look very comfortable. Can I get some cushions from my, from my lounge to like put on there? It's like, sure, absolutely, <laughs> if you want to. There's some guy in the crowd, he's yelling out, Can it, would you guys like some fish and chips? Or... <laughs> It's like, no, no, I'm full of cake. <laughs> there are people coming over to us and shaking our hands and saying, thank you. Thank you for speaking the truth. And then, I could not believe this, but this woman, maybe in her 60s, came over and she said, she said, I'm a Jew. She said, I'm not a Christian like you. She said, I'm not actually even a religious Jew. She said, uh, but my mother's whole extended family were murdered by the Nazis during the Holocaust. 
And I heard stories of how so many of them tried to seek asylum in other parts of the world and no one would accept them. And she said, I just, I just want to stand with you. And I said to her, well, we're not just activists. We're followers of Jesus. In fact, God revealed to your people, the Jews, this vision of a world in which justice reigned, in which everything was made right, in which the outsider, the refugee, was welcomed at the table, a vision of the world where every tribe and every tongue and every people and every coloured skin would be knitted into this extraordinary covenant that the Jews had made with Yahweh. But they couldn't do it. They stumbled and fell and never lived up to all their greatest dreams and hopes of what this world should be like. But we believe that a Jew came, the ultimate Jew, the super Jew. <laughs> the Jewiest Jew that had ever come. We believe that Jesus came and did what Israel could not do. He satisfied this covenant with Yahweh in a way that Israel couldn't do. And now he unleashes his spirit upon us to transform us from the inside out to be everything that Israel couldn't be. There's a guy standing next to me. We were all in a line, so we couldn't really kneel around her. But uh, he starts to talk to her about how King Jesus has set him free. He introduces Hava, who'd, the Iraqi woman who'd come to faith after she came to Australia. And she said to us, I want to believe. And Jared, my friend, said, it takes only the tiniest faith to start this journey. She said, I want to. At that point... The police stepped forward and said, police rescue are here, they're going to cut you free, I'm going to arrest you. And so she said, I'm with them. <laughs> and he's like, whatever. <laughs> and then the police rescue guys go like into the, into the um, grounds of the Prime Minister's house and then from behind, like they grab these chains, like they're choking us with these angle grinders, sparks flying everywhere. I'm like, not the beard. <laughs> They're cutting each of us free. And some of my brothers and sisters, like while they're being choked like this, are proclaiming the gospel of our Lord Jesus and demanding that we repent of our evil and our greed. And then when all of us were freed, it's like, you're under arrest. And she said, this Jewish woman said, seriously, I am with them. I said, join us, sister. Join us with the little tiny bit of faith that you have. Join us, this feeble band of Jesus' followers. Join us and find freedom. Join us and find a whole new way of being human. And with that, we're all bundled into the back of a police wagon. It's a strange way to find freedom, being locked up in a police van. My friends, there's a trans woman in Sydney who just wants to believe that Christians can actually live the way Jesus told us to. 
There's an old guy who runs a store around the corner who just wants to believe that there's actually truth and beauty and justice in this world. There's a Jewish woman who's lost her whole extended family but found faith just because we lived in the most unlikely way. To whom have you been sent? Among whom must you live this questionable and unconventional life? Who do you need to have question you for why you live the way you live? Do you follow? I'm going to invite you to stand. And I believe that it would be appropriate for me to give you just a brief moment. Those of you who this weekend have really felt that God has convicted you and called you afresh to the work of his mission in this world, to be the kind of called people that Brian talked about, to embrace prayer as we heard about this morning or justice as we heard about this afternoon. Or for those of you who've been silent too long and need to be reminded of your need to speak the name of Jesus into the context in which you find yourselves. If God has laid conviction upon your heart, if the Holy Spirit has kindled a fresh flame within you, if you know that you need to acknowledge his word into your life, I want to give you a very simple and ancient liturgy to follow. Sometimes the things that happen within us, in our minds and our spirits, need to be enacted for us to feel like they're concrete. And so I'm going to invite you to come forward I'm going to ask you to bend your knee. It's an ancient and humiliating act. You bend the knee and you say, accept this feeble offering. Use me. Send me, teach me to pray. Invite me back into your work of justice and proclamation. I offer myself to you. In a minute, I'm going to pray for you. And then I would never ask anyone to do something that I myself wouldn't do, so I will kneel at the front of this room. If God has ignited something fresh, a new vision, a new passion, if God has called you to repent, to stop something or to take something up, and you want to acknowledge that you have heard that before him. I invite you to come and to bend your knee, O feeble one, and offer yourself afresh into the service of our King and Master, Lord Jesus. Let me pray, and then I will kneel, and as many or as few who need to may join me. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray for these men and women who are bowed before you and ask, Lord, that the words that you have been speaking, the conviction that you have been laying upon their lives, the vision, the ideas, the stimulation, the excitement or the fear, whatever it is that you've put in their hearts, Father, might it be that in responding to you in this moment, might it be that in, in enacting a response to you, you might confirm in their lives the very things that you have said and quicken their resolve to continue on this long and beautiful journey. Might your kingdom come and might your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.